May I take this time to greet the church in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. It is indeed a great pleasure to come and worship with the saints this morning. I just believe one of you like myself is also taking it as a pleasure to come and worship here. Can I see that hand if there is a person who says it's a pleasure this morning? Praise God. Say amen to yourselves. Amen. Elder Tom, Elder Paul Ngugo, and uh, Elder Boaz Munga, with uh, your team, Sister Vain Lumumba and Sister Odiambo. Thank you very much for inviting me to worship with you this morning. And also for putting it into your schedule, this kind of a combined program for the day. We praise God and uh, I'm equally grateful to be part of it. Thank you very much for that music, choir. I take it that we are going to spend... Uh, this day together and hoping that is not your last song yeah, isn't it uh, all right so there are still some more songs that we will enjoy uh, together uh, when i was invited here i was informed that uh, today is the church building day and also the welfare day so i have a combination of uh, these two together in my head. As I was still trying to prepare for it, I was struggling how to strike the balance. How do I do the balance to influence God's children? In one way or the other. It's not like uh, the two, prog two programs are not in no. But uh, you see, when you provide a message, you would not need to stretch two emphasis at the same time. I hope where you are seated, you, are seated, you will continue praying for me uh, so that the Lord may speak so very well to each one of us this morning. The text has been read and I would like to read it once again. First Samuel 17, verse 32. Then David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. That is our text. I came here, uh, I should think it's last week. It's my first time here to meet your numbers and your faces. But it's not my first time to come in this vicinity. So last week I came ahead just to come and see. If you are talking about church building, where is this church located? How does this church look like? What is its point of influence? What impact do you stand to make either now or in the next near future? What opportunities uh, do you have as a church. So the topic of my sermon says our prevailing argument our prevailing argument if you watch two teams debating at the end of the day, 
you have an ultimate choice that one team is going to win the debate that moment. The same thing comes on daily basis. For some of you that may not know that the great controversy takes place daily. What did I say? It takes place daily. And the great controversy between good and evil is all about who wins the day per day. Who walks away with the influence upon men and women who are living on the surface of the earth? Who at the end of the day will paint a good picture that will be favorite to him, either Satan or Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior? Who will have a day? Who will go with the lion's share home? May I let you know that the great controversy doesn't start in our generation. The great controversy started before we were born. So many generations, even before our world was created, the great controversy was there. So it's older than each one of us. But in each and every generation of human's existence, Christ has always counted upon the people who will serve as his agents to win the day on his behalf. Not only has he chosen a group of people in each generation, he has installed the mighty spirit of God to move upon the hearts of the people. As we will be going through the text and discuss this morning, I hope you will pray that God may continually move upon our hearts and move upon the hearts of the people in the city. So as I came here, I noticed that you are in the center of this city, Nairobi. And I wondered, what's the membership of this local church? And uh, what is the membership of all the churches in Nairobi? I wish to know how much Influence does Seventh day Adventist Church have in this mighty city? And that will be by the numbers of the church, churches and numbers of the membership total together in this entire city. And not only end there, it will be by per influence of each and every member on daily basis, not only on the Sabbath. What influence do each member give in the air, wherever we are and wherever we are functioning? What influence do we cast? I'm made to know that this New Life SDA Church is probably the second or the first is the largest church in Nairobi. So the leaders do not know whether it is the first or is the second, but they keep on changing. Uh, sometimes you are the largest, sometimes you are the second. So in my view, you are standing at a very good strategic point. I hope it is not just by numbers. It is also by your influence. The things that you do, the programs that you set in place. New Life SDA Church stands in a city of about 4.4 million people, depending on the times of the day, whether it's daytime or it is in the evening time. Because I'm told there are some people who increase the population of this city who stay outside the city. Am I right? 
All right. So 4.4 million against about 3,000 members at New Life SDA Church and some many more of the local churches in Nairobi. I should think uh, we are able to make an argument here. The church with these numbers we should be able to make a statement. Am I right? Now I'm not getting you. Given the numbers, whether they are the numbers in the books or they are numbers that are visible in the floors of the church, we must be able to make a statement every day. We must be able to make a statement. You may think you are fewer in numbers when you compare yourself against 4.4 million. You think you are just a drop in the bucket. All what God needs is credible membership. People who can commit to the cause of his name. A resilient people who can insist and persist on the statement that Christ is Lord and he reigns. He needs a church that can unflinchingly proclaim the third angel's message in the context of the time we have today. Christ needs a generation of the Seventh-day Adventists that do, not, that do know how to carry his narrative per day. Notice that I'm emphasizing per day. A church that is able to carry the narrative of Jesus per day. In the great controversy, Satan has also created his narrative and he has scheduled it, categorized it per capita. He has people that he has employed on the ground to run his narrative in the minds of the people. But does Jesus have the people that can drive his narrative on daily basis. When they wake up in the morning, they have a scheduled narrative to drive. Do we have those people at New Life as dear church? As we engage this morning, I would like us to engage with the story of David and Goliath. I've chosen the story David and Goliath in chapter 17 of 1 Samuel because of the numerical ratios, the church vis-a-vis -vis the population of the city itself, the infrastructural visibility vis-a-vis -vis the high-rising towers behind us here. The fiscal structures they speak a lot to who wins the day. As we are going into this passage, I do not think that is a new passage to you. I do not even think I'm the first one to preach on this passage. It is a common passage. So, I do introduce to you a great argument that lasted 40 days of a stalemate, in case you did not know. An argument that was located on the ridges of the valley of Ella. You know, I had requested the technician to put some 
picture there on the screen, some, some sort of a map that will show you something. I don't know whether that is successful. Unfortunately, where I'm standing, I can't see a screen facing me. That is on. Uh, if it is quite a difficult job, dear technician, uh, just signal to me. I can just continue. Okay, I continue. It will come. So if you read the first verse of chapter 17, the Bible says, Now the Philistine gathered their armies together to battle. And were gathered at Soko, which belongs to Judah. They encamped between Soko and Azekah in Ephes Damim. Now the very first mention of the nation in this chapter are the Philistines. You would expect that because the Bible talks about the Hebrew people, they are the first ones to be mentioned. Here the Bible mentions the Philistines. The Philistines are the ones that are gathered for battle. The location that is mentioned here, it is around the city of Soko. And the Bible says the city of Soko belonged to Judah. The enemies, in other words, had come too close to the borders of Judah. They had even entered the territories beyond their sphere of influence. They are grabbing on the influence of the children of God. And they are ready and arrayed for battle to take over the territory. Those are the Philistines. They were not small people. They were not easily intimidated. They were pushing their own assigned agenda for the day. They were responsible. They were on duty. And they meant it. They were prepared for war. They didn't come unprepared. Don't miscalculate the Philistines here. They were prepared for the day. They were well armed and they knew their strategic points. They didn't have to call for war when they were in Philistine territory. No. For them to make a war, they came into the territory of Judah. So called. And they chose best places. By coming to the valley of Elah, they stood somewhere on top of the ridge on the horizon by numbers. And we are told that the children of Judah were also there. Verse 2. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together. And they encamped in the valley of Elah. And drew up in battle array against the Philistines. The Philistines stood on a mountain on one side. And Israel stood on a mountain on the other side. With a valley between them. Do you have the picture now? The Philistines are on the other side of the valley. The Israelites with Saul are on the other side of the valley. And between them, it's a very good valley that has a very good base. And according to their intentions, they thought to make this valley a mass grave for the Israelites that day. That's why I'm saying they were prepared for an encounter. Anyone who would descend the valley would become a victim of a circumstance for the day. He will have to pay the price by his life. 
But they had to start it in a strategic way. Now, Philistines were a great people. Yes, Elder. Thank you very much, Elder. The nation of Philistine, they were not small people, as I said. They were a nation of great five cities. Those five cities, the first one was Ashdod, which was 54 kilometers from Jerusalem. It was also on the coastline of the Mediterranean Sea. The second city of the Philistines were Ashkelon. That was 77 kilometers from Jerusalem. The name Ashkelon comes from the trade name Shekel, which was the currency prominent that time. Not only was it a currency, but also it was uh, the scaling measurements in terms of trade, like kilograms and grams of the day. So that tells you Ashkelon was a city, was a commercial city by the seashores. You know how the shore cities are influential in terms of trade. People coming in and developments come in through the cities that are on the coastline before they go inland. And that's the, which, which is the city that is by the seashore here, Mombasa. Yeah, very influential location. So if you want to influence the citizens of this country, the seashores are very, very important, the, seas, uh, the, the shore cities. So Ashkelon was such a strategic place, place for the influence of the culture of the Philistines. Gaza was only 77 kilometers also from Jerusalem. We are told was on a hill rising 60 meters above the floor of the valley. And between this Gaza and the sea were rising St. Jews. Another city was Ekron that was only 45 kilometers from Jerusalem. And the last city was Gath. Gath was only 36 kilometers from Jerusalem. We are told this is the home city for Goliath and the sons of Anak. If you read about the sons of Anak, were such type that were of giants, people of high stature. This is the place where Samson met his death. They were not small people. These were type of the Canaanites that intimidated the 12 spies that spied the land of Canaan from the Hebrew side. These are the people, by just their looks, they had to change the narrative of the spies. You see, there are some people whom when you look at them, they don't have to say anything, but they change how you are to say anything from your mouth. They take care of your tongue. The tongue is inside you. The brain is inside your scalp. But by their physique, they are in charge. So we are told when the tall spies, after seeing this intimidating stature of people, instead of talking about the power of the living God, they started talking about how tall those people were like. These were sons of Anak, the remnants of those that were still existing. <laughs> when you continue with this narrative that we are reading this morning, as the battle per day was raging on the valley of El, the Bible tells us of a certain figure among them. His name was Goliath. The Bible 
begins to mention his profile and credential. The Bible says Goliath was a champion. That's the first thing. So this choice man, he was a champion. His height was six cubits and a span according to the scriptures. You know, I spent a day yesterday trying to size myself against the measurements that I mentioned here. A cubit is from the elbow to the second finger here, the middle finger. So if you have six of that, you make it now six times time a span of that. The half of it could only go as far as this. That is my shoulder. So, in other words, I am somehow three cubits tall to my shoulder. But, but now the double of it, because the guy was six cubits. Now, I can even raise my hand. He was still higher than my hand. Not only was he that tall, the guy was huge. He was not a small person. The Bible tells me he had a bronze helmet. And his coat of mail, that is the coat that he puts on, on his shoulder and on the tummy here to protect himself, that is made out of metals. It weighed 5,000 shekels and that is about 56 kgs. Now, I'm only about 70 kg. And I'm unable to lift a 50 kg bag of cement. But this guy, with the size of his body, he could carry it on his body and walk around and even run with it. I wish those pictures we should see them. So this guy was so huge. Not only could he carry on a daily basis, on a very fast speed when he runs in the battle with those kg he had bronze arm armor on his legs the bible tells me he had a javelin between his shoulders that he carried the head of the spear that he carried was 7 kg a human shield bearer walked in front of him now this guy when he enters the battlefield and he begins carrying the weight of his body to begin running towards you instead of throwing a spear you think of creating a space for him because you wouldn't have a space to even throw your spear toward him he is enough to take care of your fighting space and as if he is also coming running with the whole wind and the storm surrounding him. When he enters battle, he is so enormous. No man can size himself against him. People of such stature do not have small voices. They had big voices. So this man, this very day, comes out of the many thousands and millions of the Philistines. Then he shouts across the valley. And his voice was pealing with great echoes, beating the rocks and the lowlands of the valley of Ella. And then he says, Why have you come up out and line up for battle, Judah or Israel? As he cries like this, asking a question, he is sure that his voice is reaching the camp where Israel is, where King Saul is seated. And it does not only reach in one wavelength, it goes with several Echoes. Am I not a Philistine? Philistine, Philistine, Philistine. 
Why have you come for battle, for battle, for battle? And as the echoes were coming with waves, the first wave was hitting King Saul. The second wave that came from an echo finished him. The remaining waves finished the entire army before he came into the battlefront. He says, you are the servants of Saul. But now here's an interesting proposal he's putting across. He says, choose a man for yourselves. Let him come down to me. That's his proposal. Because it has been lasting 40 days on a, on a, of a stalemate. Now he's bringing a proposal. He says, choose <laughs> choose a man of yourselves. The man that is able to come and fight me. That proposal created a havoc in the church of God. There was a problem in the church of God. Choose a man among you. The question that I'm bringing to you this morning. Is there a man in Israel? Are there people in the church? Do we, do we have men? Do we have membership of quality? So you see, when he said choose a man, he was now looking for individual quality. He was now looking for one single heart. Now he knew that he was a Philistine and the king of Israel is Saul. I have mentioned to you the physical stature of Goliath. But now as he said this, he had King Saul in mind. When you read 1 Samuel chapter 9, verse 2, the Bible tells you how Saul was chosen to be a king. The Bible tells you that Saul was a choice man. Did you hear that? According to the version that I read, Saul was a what? Was a choice man among the people. It tells us Saul was taller than any of the people of his nation. Do you see him somehow meeting Goliath? Somehow also he was what? He was taller. The Bible tells us, not only was he taller, Saul was handsome. You see, there are people in the church that are well built and they are very handsome. I'm not here for family life, dear ladies. But I almost got tempted to take a detour. They are people, men of God, who are very clean, whom God washed drugs from their veins, whom God cleaned their teeth and bath every day, who eat so very well, who do understand the health principles how they should influence. So, you have no excuse to go and look for one outside. Saul was a handsome man, well trained in the battlefield as he stood above the masses. He stood head tall above them. He met all the credentials that were physical, which could make him a king. But on the spiritual side, the Bible tells us Samuel sought for his attention and sent away the servants and remained to anoint King Saul. He was anointed a commander over his people in verse 16. So much that the Spirit of God came upon him. The Bible tells that he prophesied among the prophets. You see, that is King Saul. So, when Goliath was shouting over the valley, over the valley,
value of Ella, he had a soul in mind because that's the greatest man in the nation. But there was something that had changed Saul to meet his opponent on the other side. If you read chapter 15 of the same book, 1 Samuel, you will understand that somehow Saul had a problem of waiting for God. Saul had developed a spiritual problem of rebellion. He had developed a challenge of rebelling against God and pleasing his opponents. His heart was spiritually watered down. He was no longer a person who possessed his influence per day. So, was not moving around with the angels of God per day. The spirit of God was no longer hovering upon his heart per day. Saul had a problem though he was in the church per day. But he was at the head of the nation of Israel. May I challenge each one of you that are leaders here. When the Lord has placed you strategically, he has also apportioned a great amount of influence upon you. When you are chosen a leader in the house of the living God, God the Holy Spirit moves around you wherever you are. So that when the day dies and the sun set, the Lord has a day by your influence. Take care of your day. Do not play with the hours the Lord gives you from, from the sun, from the, from the rising of the sun. The Lord gives you an influence. You may have a human influence that is quite so short, but when God comes upon your life, your influence extends beyond your outlook. Your influence extends beyond your human limitation. You will not know what people see when you appear before them. People in Goliath, they might see a person who is above my heart. But when they see you, they not only see your height, they see the power of the living God. Know that you have an argument for the day. Saul became too careless about himself. About his position. So much so that when the battle came, he was not ready to get into the valley himself. When the Philistines stood by the ridge of the valley, he said, I, you are not the servant of Saul. He mentioned my name. I expected Saul to descend the valley and say, here I am ready to meet you. Saul was nowhere to be found. He was hidden in the tent. Is there a man in Israel? Are there people in the church of God to stand for God? When people are busy rising a lot of influence in the air, right in the name of the world and its influence and its civilization that goes down into the hell, where is the church of God? Where are the young people of this world, of this very church? When the world itself influences young people the wrong way. Are there some young people that can stand for God and build a massive structure of influence in the world today? Where are the young people? Where are the adults of this church? Are we winning the argument? Time is running out on me. So it's giving a challenge. Choose a man. I pray that I may be that man. Who can, who can be chosen? But no man was descending the valleys of Ella that day. The day went down set. There was no man coming down. Another one arose. The same Goliath comes. Choose a man among you. No man descends the valley. 
The third day comes. Choose a man among for forty days. There were no men in Israel. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, the word choose means select. <laughs> That's what he meant. Not only select, the word there also means examine before you select. Check the one that can meet my standards. So the battle proposer, which Goliath challenged God's children with, was based on quality. He said, I want quality. So Goliath was sure of his intimidating physique. But you see, he was not sure of the quality of the heart of the people that can be intimidated by his physique. He knew so very well that he could make a statement by the way he looks. He knew that he had a day for 40 days. And he knew that at least up to 35 days, God of Israel has been insulted. And he knew that the nation of Israel has been defied. When he shouted to say, I defy the armies of Israel, the word that he uses there is pulling down. Are you there with me? Are you there with me? Wake up. Are you there with me? The word that he uses the defy is pulling down. In other words, I am shouting to pull down the influence of the armies of Israel. He's putting down the armies of Israel. Just by shouting when he said, I defy. Choose a man. But Saul had a problem. Look at his response. Not only did Saul hide inside the tent, Saul shrinked at the demands of responsibility and commitment. When duty called, when there was a lot of expenses that were required from him, he shrank inside the tent. I think we must be a church in the end time that is willing to spend and also to be spent. May I repeat that? We must be a church that is willing to spend and also be spent. God does not only have a resource that he has provided surrounding our stay here on earth, but God owns you as the first primary resource. We'll talk about it in the afternoon briefly. God's first resource is myself. Before he can spend gold and silver and animals that he has given under our possession. God at least is sure of one person. And that's you whom he has redeemed by the blood of his son. He's sure of that one. But when duty called for soul, for him to be spent no longer his money, no longer treasurers in the palace, but himself to descend the valley he thought of his wives. He thought of his sons. He thought of the wealth that he had. Could you be thinking the same way? That when God calls you for duty, when God calls for your life and energy to be spent, you think about your children, you think about your family members, you think about your people, you think about your influence elsewhere. Friends, we have no influence in this world when our influence cannot be expended in the house of the living God. 
If you didn't know the time is running out for the world, the clock of judgment is fast ticking down. They have no time in the world. But we have been given a little time to influence. When God says, choose a man through the mouth of Goliath, he meant you, yourself. You are the man. I mean, yes. you are the man. Do not raise an excuse. Do not look at your neighbor. You are the man. God is looking for you. But you see, as he freezed, children of Israel also freezed. At that very time when there was no man in Israel. <laughs> Praise God. The Bible tells me a shepherd boy was sent by his father. When there was a stalemate in the valleys of Elah, Goliath for 40 days was taking on an argument with Israel. A shepherd boy left the flock. He also went to the battlefront. And when he brought food, he heard the pealing voice, the echoes, the daily echoes that were intimidating of Goliath. He asked the question, what is this I'm hearing? What is this? Somebody seems to be insulting our nation. It's insulting our God. What is happening? He started asking people that were closer to him. They started explaining to him. Then his brothers, Eliab, Shama, and the other one, hey, you boy, what are you looking for here? You have just come here to start looking for the world. Go back there. It's dangerous here. The person who's speaking there will swallow you alive. He said, no, 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 no. Wait, wait, wait. He ignored his brothers. You know, family relations. Even when elder brothers sometimes try to give a warning, there are some people who say, no, 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 no. Let me listen to somebody else. So he asked from other people. They told him, if anyone will kill this Philistine, the king promised that he'll be given a wife to marry and great fortunes. So he made a proposal also. The proposal this time around does not end on the other side of the valley. It has met its own recipient in particular. And he has arrived. The son of Jesse, David, the future king of Israel, has arrived. He's not putting on an armor. He's not, put, he's not carrying a spear. But he's carrying the heart of the living God. He is now in the campsite. And when he came, he looked for the king. He said, I'm looking for a king. And Abner got him the presence of the king's soul. He said, I'm hearing an insult flying in the air on daily basis. I am here. May I tell you, O oh king, allow me, I can go and fight that person. And that's where the text is born from. That says, let no man's heart fail because of him. I am here. Let no man's heart fail. Your servant will go. I will go and fight this Philistine. Saul looks at him. He measures him. He's not even taller than Saul. He looks at the Philistine. He says, young man, do you know a person we are talking about? Not only is he huge, he has been a warrior from his youth. He said, oh my Lord, your servant has been a shepherd. And I have killed both a lion and a bear with my hands. He said, oh king, when the bear got a lamb from my flock, I would myself, not, the, not, 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 not anybody else, I would myself go and get it. Do you hear what David is saying? David is saying, I will myself, before I even kill it, I will go and get the lamb. I have a courage to meet that kind of a lion that is making noise on the valley. And if the lion would want to charge at me, I would get it myself with my own hands and kill it. 
And so it has happened also to a, to a lion and to the bear. If you give me a chance, O king, I can meet that Philistine. I have what it takes. I have God. I have the heart that God has prepared to meet that Philistine on the valley. So he made his proposal, his statement clear, his profile so clean, which the nation of Israel, no, the commanders didn't know. He said, I may, I may be clear here. Give me a job. I'm ready to deliver today in the, hand, in the name of the Lord. Give it to me. Now, at this time, King Saul makes a mistake. He takes his heavy armor and places it on the young man. He says, go and fight. Do you know what that meant? This is what that meant. The protection that was given to King Saul, he gave it over to David. King Saul did not know it is at this time that his wearing of his kinship and giving it over to the young man. He did not know that this is the time when he is removing his dignity and glory in the nation, giving it over to the young man. That was a symbolic way of removing kinship from himself and over to the next king. While he was doing this, it was what out of frustration and fear of the circumstance. He gave it over. So David tried it on. Said, okay, I appreciate, O king, that you have given me everything. But this thing, I cannot use it. May I put it aside? Let me descend the valley by myself. The young man descended the valley. You know the story so very well. He chose five smooth stones and put them in his bag. And, and, and as he met the, 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 the champion on the other side, they started exchanging the first words. As he was busy insulting on the other side, he said, by the name of the Lord that you have insulted, I'm going to cut your head from your body. That very lips that are insulting God will be cut from your body. Today, not tomorrow, not next 40 days. Today, you will be the flesh for the birds of the air. So this provocative exchange started to make King Goliath, so sorry, this champion Goliath to come closer and with his huge body and looking at that one, the very first throw was from the shepherd ball. It was strong enough to make an impact. The very first shot was enough to take care of the day. He was in charge. As the stone was flying, whizzing through the air. The spirit of the living God descended upon the moving stone. It was no longer a stone that was moving. It was the hand of the living God. As it was flying, it sank in the forehead of a giant. And all of a sudden, the huge stature and the argument of the Philistine fell like a mountain. As he was falling down, a cloud of dust was rising to greet the people on the other side of the Philistine. Somebody mighty has fallen. But who has risen? The name of the Lord has been risen. The argument of the Lord is back into the air. God is in charge. You see, church, when you trust the living God, together with your children, together with your young people, together with your aged people, when you trust the Lord, God gains the day. God wins the argument. God has something in your pocket. My friends, for 20 years, you built this structure. For 20 years, you were worshipping on this structure. The Philistines were winning the argument. And I'm declaring today, that's enough for the Philistines. 
That is too much enough. It's too long enough for them to build something of influence around here. We are no longer going to allow them to do that on the name of the Lord. Something worthy the name of the Lord must rise from this, from this ground. And I know there is somebody seated in that very corner. There is somebody seated in that very corner whom the Lord has given his own great heart. Like David, who can rise and say, may the name of the Lord be raised once again. May the flag of heaven, the banner of Emmanuel, be lifted up. Somebody is there saying that this morning. And that is my appeal. Is there a man? Is there a man among ourselves? <laughs> Twenty years have too long for the lost name to be insulted. Not even an hour should we allow our Lord to be insulted. That man Jesus, I'm talking about Jesus, whom when he died on the cross, he had taken care of both the heavens and the earth. When Jesus was lifted on the cross, he said, if I be lifted up on the cross, I will draw all men unto myself. In other words, you are saying, I have a day. When Jesus was lifted on the mountain of Calvary, everybody was there. All men of people had come at the foot of the mountain. You see, Jesus this time around did not have to fight on the valley. He took the battleground to the higher grounds. He raised his battlefield on the top of Calvary. And the nails were brought. And they were driven through his hand. The spears were there also ready to test if he died. When Jesus was hanging on the cross, Satan thought he had a day. Jesus in his heart, the son of David, said, wait, I'm still counting a few more minutes. You no longer have the day. Until the time when Jesus' testimony was complete, when the sacrifice was done of him, he said, it is finished. When he said it is finished, that's when the eyes of Satan began to open. That's when he knew the price for all the sinners has been paid. That's when he knew all the bridges for all the sinners beyond the gulf have been built. That's when he knew all the sins have been forgiven. He knew that all the generations are going to be saved. He said, ah, I have lost a battle so sudden like that. Is this how I lost? Satan at that very time, he looked up into the heavens and saw other worlds and how the other worlds and other atoms and other angels elsewhere looked at him. They said, you are no longer hidden, oh Satan. You are a murderer. He sought for a hiding. The whole universe knew about the nature of the satanic influences. They knew. But when everyone turned their own eyes to Jesus, whom the world has pierced, people repented. They found salvation in the Lord. What a look on the Calvary. This look is the one that makes each one of us to come this far. The look of Calvary. Brothers and sisters, the singer says Jesus saves. Jesus saves. Have you listened to that last stanza? Of that song. Give the winds a mighty voice. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. Let the nation now rejoice. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. Shout salvation full and free. Highest hills and deepest caves. This our song of victory. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. The singer sings, Jesus saves. 
Why can't new life SDA church also sing Jesus saves, Jesus saves. When you build the structures and facilities for the Lord, you are saying Jesus has conquered our hearts. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. You may not have a voice to sing like beautiful singers that do sing here. But when you put your hand into the work, when you commit your heart into the work, when you bring yourself to be spent, you are saying, Jesus saves, Jesus saves. I'm ready to pray for somebody before I sit down. I have not come here just to return without a prayer. I'm ready to pray for somebody seated here who is saying, Pastor, I want to sing the song, Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Pastor, I want to be part of it, of the argument that flies in the air. Pastor, I want to be the part of victory, winning the argument in this city of Nairobi. I want to be part of it. Whether you are young, whether you are a child, whether you are aged, do you want to sing a song? Jesus saves. If it is your choice, if you are willing to be spent to give anything closer to you to make sure the name of the Lord and the cross of Jesus is lifted up, if you are willing to do that, and you are not going to raise any politics here until the name of the Lord is lifted up, can you rise? If you are unwilling and you are sure that you are going to be troubled financially, you are going to be troubled physically and with your influence and you don't want to give that, please, you can just be seated. Nobody forces you here. Neither will I say you are anti-Christian. No, you may not be ready. I'm calling for those that are saying, we have leaders that are willing to put down a plan we have time for, 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 for the Lord to lift up his name, but I'm here. The Lord needs people. Those people that are in those slums there, they need to be taken care of financially. They are the poorest members in the church here. They need to be taken care of. Jesus saves. Now that you are standing, let us close our eyes and pray. Our Heavenly Father, you have given us Jesus, the name that is above all the names. The name besides it, we can never see salvation this afternoon Lord we stand as mortals our days Lord are numbered even when we look at our hearts we tremble all we can read about ourselves are our sins Lord and they are so terrible to us Lord that we feel they may not allow us to do your will. Our young people, they are still young in their hearts, Lord, to face the project before us. May you explain to each one of us, Lord, and convince us through the whispering of the Spirit of the living God how we shall contribute to the glory of your name. We stand surrendering ourselves to be spent before our resources are also spent. We count ourselves, Heavenly Father, as your primary resource. And we come as we are. You know that we have nothing of our own. All that we shall give you has always been yours. The breath that is inside our nostrils is always from your supplies. The health law that you have given us and our, to our children has ever been flowing all this time toward us. So what are we? The only thing that we do this afternoon 
is to, to surrender ourselves to you, Almighty God. We desire that the ground where we are standing, if your son will delay from coming, Heavenly Father, that this ground may raise a great name, a glory to your name, Heavenly Father. May you touch us in a special way to give us the speed that will not lose impetus, that will help us finish the projects. Bless us abundantly according to the demands of your needs in the battleground. For we ask it. We ask it, loving Father. We ask it in the name of Jesus Christ your son and our friend and our savior. Amen. May God bless you.